Over the next few weeks, uh, I am going to be in a series uh, called Nehemiah, and we're going to, it's really titled Arise, and we're going to study through the book of Nehemiah, and so today we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 1. And I'm reading out of the Amplified. We're going to read the entire uh, chapter, which is not my tradition. But it's only 11 verses, so you're going to be okay. All right? So whenever you leave, you can, like, check off on your Bible read plan that you did it. You you read a whole chapter in your Bible today. You're like a super Christian. Uh, Maybe you already read a chapter in your Bible today for that. Good job. This is like bonus round, okay? So we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 1. And it says this, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakali. Who Now it happened in the month of Chilzev, in the 20th year of the Persian king, as I was in the capital of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them about the surviving Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken, and its fortified gates have been burned and destroyed by fire. Now it came about when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven and I said, please, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you day and night. On behalf of your servants, the sons of Israel, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have committed against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Please remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful and violate your obligations to me, I will scatter you abroad among among the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you have been scattered are in most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place where I've chosen for my name to dwell. Now they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. Please, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and make your servant successful this day and grant him compassion in the sight of this man, the king. For I was cupbearer to the king of Persia. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, because we have a saying here at one church that paper never forgets. Can you title this time together, Arise and Return? Arise and return. Can we pray as we continue our time together? Father, I just thank you. Uh, Lord, I do believe that this is a God-breathed word. That, God, I just ask that over these next four weeks, that, God, I ask that you deepen uh, your love, the people's love for you, your word, in this time. That, God, I just thank you that you're moving. Lord, I just declare every ear is open and receptive. Every heart is softened for the seed of the word of God. I declare every life will be changed, that no one will leave this place the same. In Jesus' name. And every person who believed it said, amen, amen. You know, I was so excited um, at the possibility of studying Nehemiah together over the next four weeks. And the reason for it is this, is I found so many Christians, uh, whenever I talk to them, I will ask them about reading their Bible. And they say, oh, I don't read my Bible. I just don't understand it. And I I think that's wild to me because you read Facebook and you understand it. (laughs) You read CNN and Fox News and you understand it. You you read all kinds of things. You read uh, books and novels and you understand those. So if you can read all of that, then you can read this. Now, I would understand that if our Bibles were written still in Greek and Hebrew, it would be kind of hard to understand. But you have a Bible that has been transliterated into English. You can understand it. Um, But I found this, that the reason why we feel like we can't understand is the enemy knows that if he can cloud our minds and our eyes to seeing the word, then he can keep our lives from its full potential. And so he makes us by the lie of I don't understand it to keep us from reading it. And I just want to lean yeah, you to lean in these next four weeks. And might I just call you up a little bit higher that maybe in your own personal devotion time that you decide, I'm going to read through the book of Nehemiah. It's not very long. It's just a few chapters. And, and in four weeks, you're going to read through the book of Nehemiah and become a student of the word. And I promise you this, that as you read it, it's going to begin to grow you. I always teach it like this. You don't remember every meal you've ever had. 
Do you remember what you had last Wednesday for lunch? Probably not, right? How about two weeks ago Wednesday? No, probably not. But uh, you remember a few meals that you've had over the last two weeks, right? But every meal you've eaten has sustained you and gotten you to be here today. The same way with our time spent in God's word. Sometimes you read it and you feel like you blacked out and you just came back too. Does anybody ever have that happen? Like you're reading it and all of a sudden it's like you black out and you're like, oh my gosh, I just read a whole chapter, but I don't remember anything. But here's the thing is it doesn't keep you from reading again. It's the same way as when you're driving home and you don't remember how you got there. You're like, was the, red, was the light red or was it green? Like, like you don't even realize how you got there. It doesn't mean that you stopped driving right? And the same is true with the word. Every time you spend time in this book, it's changing you. Every time you spend that time in this book, it's molding you. And the enemy wants you to believe the lie that you don't understand it because he knows that when you spend time in this book, this book starts changing you. And so I want to challenge you to lean in. So uh, the book of Nehemiah, originally, whenever the Bible was in order and they had it for the Jewish people, Ezra and Nehemiah uh, was put together. And it was at the time of the Reformation with Martin Luther uh, that they decided that Ezra and Nehemiah should actually be grouped into two separate writings, Ezra because he wrote it and Nehemiah because he wrote it. And, and they actually are 70 years apart. And so there are two different books now in our Bible, but they were originally in one book. And it was because what happened is in 586 BC, the Babylonians had come in and they had destroyed Jerusalem. They tore down the temple, they destroyed the city, they they burned the people's houses. They took it over. So all of God's people uh, were exiled out from there. And they were exiled for 50 years. And after 50 years, 50,000 Jewish people got together and they said, let's go back and rebuild the city. We want to reclaim what God has. But the first assignment that God gave them whenever they came into the city was to rebuild the temple. The first thing to be done, not rebuild the walls, not rebuild your homes, not rebuild the streets, not rebuild anything. They could not do anything until the temple was rebuilt. Might I just tell you that when the enemy wants to destroy a city, the first thing he'll do is take out a church. When the enemy wants to destroy a nation, the first thing he'll do is go after the church. When the enemy wants to destroy a family, he'll get you offended at somebody in the church. Woo, just got personal there, didn't I? Why? Because the enemy knows the strength of a city, the strength of a family, the strength of a nation is founded upon first the strength of a church. And when they go in to rebuild a nation, God says, first, you must rebuild my house. And what you're doing every Sunday when you come to church, every Sunday when you choose to give and bring to God the first of your income, every Sunday when you choose to serve, not just get rostered on Dream Team, but show up when you're rostered on Dream Team, you're saying, I'm going to allow God to use me to rebuild the house of God so my family can be built up, so my city can be built up, so my nation can be built up. God knew the strength of a city is predicated upon the strength of his church. And a lot of times I see it the opposite. We're like, God build our nation, God build my family, God build my house, God build my city, and then we'll build your church. And God says, no, build my church and then I'll build your nation. Build my church and then I'll build your family. Oh, so they go, and in and, and Ezra, it tells us it took Ezra and the people of God 20 years to rebuild the temple. They spend the next 72 years. Are y'all okay? Welcome to Big Kid Church. You're, this, you're learning. This is good. You feel yourself growing? You're like a little theologian now. You can come out of here and be like, well, you know, it took 20 years to rebuild the temple in Ezra, <laughs> in the book of Ezra. So then they took 72 years trying to rebuild the walls, and they were unsuccessful because of all the enemy coming against them. And so now we find ourselves here in the book of Nehemiah. It's interesting because Nehemiah, I'll give you a cliff notes or spark notes, if you will. Um, the end of Nehemiah, basically, he rebuilds the city in 52 days. What they did 72 days in their own strength and own power, God did in 52 days. Never underestimate what God can do in a season of your life. Never underestimate what God can do in just 52 short days. 52 days could completely change everything that you and your family has ever known. And so, but before all this happens, Nehemiah asks, and he asks about the city. And when he finds out, he finds out that the city is in ruin, that there are reproach, but there's a remnant people. 
And instead of turning away and looking the other way, he decides he's going to lean in to the information. In fact, hearing this, he's so moved. Might I just tell you that every miracle from God, every great thing we read about in our Bible first happened when a person heard about the state of the people and they were moved with compassion. Abraham was moved with compassion for Lot, and so he interceded for him, and God rescued Lot out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. When we see Moses, Moses had compassion for the Israelite people that were being oppressed by Egypt. And so God, in a moment, as he's interceding for the people, God, in a moment, empowers Moses to be the one who would deliver them out. Fast forward to David, sees the state of the nation of Israel, and he's got a passion to bring back the ark of God, the presence of God, to the people of God. And God began to move on his behalf. Paul has compassion for the Gentile people. And so he then now took the gospel to the whole Roman Empire. And why do I say this? Is that every miracle from God first started happening with a people that didn't just hear information, didn't just hear statistics, but began to allow their hearts to be moved by what they heard. I wanna ask you, when you hear the state of our nation, do you just shrug your shoulders and say, I guess this is just the way it is now? Do we, do we hear about teen suicide rates that are higher than they've ever been in our nation's history and just shrug our shoulders and say, well, this is just the way it is now? Or are you moved with compassion to drive yourself down to your knees and begin to pray and cry out to God for a nation? When we see the state of things that are going on and that Christians are deconstructing at the most rapid rate, it, it is going so quickly that I will just declare to you that we need to see a revival. We need to see a second wave. We need to see a move of God from coast to coast. And I believe we're on the precipice of it. And, and I will just say, when you hear about churches closing and, and people leaving and abandoning the church and abandoning God, does it make you just go, well, it's just the way it is? Or does it drive you to a place of prayer? Because every time we see God move and God do something great, it first happened when some people didn't just hear it and were numb to it, but allowed their hearts to be moved. Nehemiah hears the state of a city that he had never even visited. And he's so moved with compassion that it drives him to prayer. There's six things in Nehemiah's prayer. In fact, uh, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah begins with a prayer recorded from him, and it ends with a prayer recorded by him. This is what they would call inclusio. If you go to the college, one college, which I'll just say more people go to one college because they want to grow spiritually than they do want to go after a secular college degree. They just want to grow deeper in their spiritual journey. In fact, we have the largest class ever enrolled starting this fall in our one college. Come on, isn't that so exciting? I can't wait to see all these people grow, um, but I will teach you all about this. But inclusio basically means this. It's kind of like bookends. We call it a sandwich at the college. And so it's like the two pieces of bread hold everything together in the middle. So Nehemiah is an inclusio of prayer. It begins with prayer and it ends with prayer. And everything that the book is about is found in the middle. Meaning that in our lives, may our lives be an inclusio of sorts. That the way we began this spiritual journey is with a prayer, and I pray that the last words that exit our lips as we leave this earth is a prayer. But uh, my hope is that all of us are sustained by prayer, everything in between. That we don't just have a prayer life that begins our faith journey and ends our faith journey, but it's a prayer life that sustains our faith journey in the middle. So it's an inclusio of sorts. In fact, there are 12 different prayers recorded by Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah. So he's a praying man. And there's six things that we see here in his prayer. And what's so cool is that these six things are the same things that we see in New Testament prayer. And why this is interesting is because Nehemiah is written in the same historical timeline Malachi is about to be written, which will then enter the 400 years of silence from the book of Malachi all the way until we see Matthew chapter 1. And so 400 years where it seems like God's silent, but God's setting them up that, hey, even when it feels like I'm silent, I'm giving you a pattern of how to pray. 
I'm giving you a pattern of how to pray that even when you feel like I'm not moving, even when you feel like I'm not speaking, even when you feel like nothing is happening, because those 400 years, God was moving, he was orchestrating, he was setting everything up for the Messiah to be born. And might I just encourage you that it's the pattern of prayer in my life that begins to declare what God's gonna do even when it feels like nothing is moving and nothing is working. So these six things, I think it's amazing. It's a prophetic declaration, if you will, of what we will have as New Testament believers we see in Nehemiah's prayer. Are we doing okay? The first one is he was consistent. He didn't have a 21 days of prayer in January and August, and that's the only time he prayed. No, it says that he prayed constantly. In fact, from Nehemiah chapter 1 to Nehemiah chapter 2, four months have passed by. And he's just praying consistently. Everything in our life should begin in prayer, end in prayer, but also be sustained in prayer. Prayer is to your spirit what air is to the body. If the only time you breathed was one time a day when you pray over dinner, come on. Can you imagine how sick you would be? Uh, inhale. Exhale. You know when Jesus said pray without ceasing? It's what do we do without ceasing? We don't even realize it. Breathing. Prayer should just be so normal. It should be like breath to us. Uh, whenever you're with Dodie Osteen, I, I love her so much. She's Joel Osteen's uh, mom. If you don't like the Osteen family, you've never met them. Because if you met them, you would love them. In fact, the first seed that was sown into our house was from Dodie Osteen. Uh, she heard about our, us launching a church, and she wanted to sow into it. And so you're sitting in the seed of the Osteen family. And so uh, I love when I'm with her because you'll be talking to her and you never know when she's praying and when she's speaking because she'll just be talking to you. How's your day? Oh, it's good. I had a flat tire. Well, Father, we just thank you right now in Jesus' name. And, and you're like, oh, I thought we were talking and now she's praying. Shouldn't it be that way in our lives? That we're in a state of constant prayer, that we never know when our daily conversation has ended and now our prayer conversation has begun. It's all just encompassing. In James 5, 16, in the second part of the verse, it says this, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of the righteous man. What is your prayer life uh, described as? Would it be described as persistent or would it be described as inconsistent? Would it, would it be described as occasional or was it, would it be described as habitual, fervent, consistent? I, I want my prayer life to be consistent. I, I said it to first service like this. Find the things that you're doing all the time and decide that those are the times and places you're going to meet with God. Uh, how many of you shower every day? Wow, way more than first service. Y'all, there was like two people that said yes to it in the first service. I'm just saying, I thought they sank after they raised their, didn't raise their hands. I knew they sank, all right? If you live in Texas, you should be showering once a day, amen? That's the minimum, all right? That's just free, okay? Um, but let me just challenge you this. My kids, when they were little, to develop a prayer time in them, I told them, whenever you go to get in the shower, just go to Spotify, go to One Church Worship, and just hit play. And while you're in the shower, just pray in the spirit. Just pray. Make an altar to the Lord in your shower that this is the time I'm just going to pray. I'm going to see God. Or what about this? What if we turned our cars, our commute time to work, into a, a holy tabernacle to the Lord, a holy altar to the Lord? Put worship music on. And as you're driving down the road, God, I thank you for every meeting I'm about to walk in. Lord, I thank you for the favor of God that surrounds me as a shield. God, I thank you that you're giving me wisdom that I don't even know where it came from. God, I ask that just as you did Gideon, that God, you put me on like a glove, that I walk into my office place. God, I walk in today with my head up and my heart open. God, show me who to pray for. Show me who to witness to. God, use me as a light. God, I pray for my kids right now. I declare that they are the pastors of their school, the leaders to their generation. God, I pray for my spouse, Lord. I thank you wherever he's at, that the anointing of God is coming upon him, that he feels your presence, that he senses you coming alongside him. Come on, how much more powerful would your morning be? If you begin to say, God, my drive time is a holy altar unto you. What is it? It's the consistent, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. I want to say to you, it's not 21 days in January and August that marks our life. It may propel your life, but it doesn't sustain you if you're not doing the daily consistent. 
it, it's the daily consistent. It, it's saying, God, every day, this is the time and the place I'm going to meet with you. A every day. It, it says it like this in Psalms. Every morning I lay out the pieces of my life before you. Do you have a place where God can count on you to be there every day? That, that God knows she's there every day, that he's going to meet me there every day, that I, if I'm looking for him, I know right where he's going to be. Are y'all okay? Number two, fasting. Nehemiah fasted. Fasting is hard, y'all. It doesn't matter how you do it. There is no such thing as an easy fast. I could tell a lot of funny stories there. <laughs> but fasting is this. It's giving up something because you want to be fully focused on the Lord. It's giving up a meal. It's giving up something, whether it's a soul fast or a food fast. It's giving up something because you want your full focus to be on the Lord. Matthew 6, 17, Jesus says this, but when you fast, not if you fast. He, he's going with the idea that we are going to live a life as Christians fasting. It's not a if you might. I will just say, if you've never fasted, it's not a when you fast, it's if you fast. So make your life be a when you fast. That I'm living a lifestyle of fasting as a believer. I'm living this lifestyle. God, uh, in my prayer time for this year, I said, God, what is my word for the year? Every year I seek the Lord on what is he saying over my year. I love it when he speaks things like, come out of hiding, I'll give you double, um, grace, banner year, abundance, like favor. Those are all good. And I was asking the Lord, I said, God, what are you saying over this year? And he said, consecration. I said, oh, that was my word. I was like, oh. So I thought that was Satan. I was like, devil is a liar. Consecration's hard. I was like, God, try again. <laughs> so I prayed for another week. I even fasted. I was like, God, give me another word than consecration. And the Lord spoke to me again and said, consecration. And I began to study out the word. And every time you see consecration mentioned in the Bible, it's right before a big move of God happens. God wants, see, fasting isn't about the food. It's about consecrating yourself. It's about living your life in a different way than the rest of the world. It's looking different. It's going through your day, your lifestyle different. I want to encourage you to have a rhythm of fasting in your life. Number three is private. He, Nehemiah kept these moments between him and God. It took him four months before God opened up a door of opportunity. And in fact, in Nehemiah 2.14, uh, whenever he finally gets to the city of Jerusalem, he rides around it by himself. He says, no one was with me except the beast I rode on. In other words, he needed a private prayer time. He needed a time where it was just him and God. He wasn't posting it on Instagram he wasn't telling everybody about it. It was just moments that are just between him and the Lord. Tozer says it like this. God knows before we do when our hearts are no longer with him. Whew. Matthew 6, 18 says, So that your fasting will not be noticed by people, but your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That whole four months that Nehemiah was praying, he was fasting, he was seeking the face of God, God was seeing exactly where he was at. The king didn't know. And might I just also remind you that the people in Jerusalem didn't know that there was somebody praying and fasting on their behalf. They had no idea that God was putting into motion a solution to their 72 years of pain. Number four, Thanksgiving. This happens on two levels. The first level is where we thank God for all that he's done. And the second level is where we thank him on credit for all that he will do. Because he's been faithful in our past. Think about this, Jesus, when he lifts up the bread before he blesses it, or I'm sorry, it's before he stands, it's when he's standing at the tomb of Lazarus. He stands at the tomb of Lazarus and he says this, he says, God, thank you that you hear me, but I thank you that you always hear me. He says, I'm thanking you on credit, but I'm also reminding you that you've always done it. I'm also thankful that you've always been faithful. And so this in our life is where we ask once, but we thank the rest of the time. I asked, my, I asked the Lord once for my brother's salvation 22 years ago, and I've been thanking him for 22 years that it's gonna come to pass. And the spiritual, the Bible says, ask, believing that you receive whatever you ask. So in the spiritual, I already have seen my brother giving his life to Christ. I 
I've already seen him being baptized. I'm just thanking God on credit because I know that he is so worthy to be thanked on credit. Let your prayer life be marked with thanksgiving. Remind yourself of the faithfulness of God. Remind yourself of his victorious deeds. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it says, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific crest known to God. I think our prayers should be marked with gratitude. Our lives should be marked with gratitude. We should have this keen awareness of thanking God for all he's done, but thanking him on credit for all that he's going to do. Number five is faith. This is where we remind God of his promises. I, I think this is so cool because I was getting ready to uh, do this message and I was reading over Nehemiah again this morning as I've been reading over it the last two months and, and I was reading over it and I realized, I was like, wow, God never told Nehemiah to go rebuild the city. You don't see a single time where God shows up, Nehemiah. If I was Brian, I would do a really cool voice there. His airline voice is so good. <laughs> I would do a really cool voice there, but it didn't happen. But he knew the word. And so in his prayer, he's quoting scripture because he knew the word, he knew God's will. He didn't need a word from God to say go because he knew God's word. He knew God's will was to rebuild the city. I will just tell you that knowing what this book says will tell you what God's will is. If he would have prayed, God, if it be your will, let me go rebuild the city. The city wouldn't have been rebuilt by Nehemiah. God would have found somebody else. His, his word told him his will, meaning that in this word, it says that all my family shall be saved. In this word, it says all my needs shall be met according to his riches and glory. In this word, it says by his stripes, I will be healed. My faith comes from what the word says, not what my circumstance says. So Nehemiah comes to God and he says, hey God, I'm gonna remind you what your word says. I'm gonna remind you of the things you've spoken. I'm gonna remind you of the prophetic declarations. He doesn't go before God and go, God, is it your will? And a lot of us are praying, God, is it your will prayers because we don't know his word. If you find his word, you find his will. You got to open this book, fall in love with this book. This is the only book that will sustain your marriage. This is the only book that will sustain your children. This is the only book that will sustain your finances. But if you don't know the book, you don't know the will. Nehemiah goes, I don't have to seek and see if it's God's will. I already know his word. And because I know his word, I know his will. And because I know his will, I can declare in faith. And because I can declare in faith, God begins to move. Because it's the prayer of faith that begins to move God. Paul wrote it like this, that faith is the currency of heaven. It's the thing that gets God up off of his throne and begins to go into action. It's the thing that begins to set things in motion. Quit praying weak-wristed prayers. God, is it your will? Yes, it's his will. And here's the thing is I love what Charles Stanley says. I pray, I pray in faith, and I leave the results up to God. And, and I just want to release that over some people. My job isn't to bring the results, but my job is to stand in faith. And, and I find it interesting because there's a lot of people who don't go to our church, but they sure come to our church when they need the prayer of faith. They, they don't come to our church, but they know where the power of God is when they need a miracle, when somebody needs to be set free, when they need breakthrough in their life. Because I'm so thankful that our church is known as a faith church. People ask me all the time, oh, well, are you one of those faith churches? We sure are. You know why? Because Jesus was a faith movement. Paul was a faith preacher. We are a faith church. We're going to believe God for miracles. And here's the thing is the results are my part. Nehemiah's only part was to pray in faith. It was God's part to move. And a lot of times I think we take the responsibility of what's gonna happen and we're trying to be God. You cannot be God and the prayer. I'm just the prayer and then I surrender. I pray in faith, I believe. So for four months, Nehemiah prayed in faith. For four months, he declared the word. For four months, I just wanna encourage you, when you're in a season of waiting on God, can you just wait in faith? Put, put some scriptures all around your house, some sticky notes all around your house, some stuff on your bathroom mirror that reminds you what the word of God says. Change your lock screen on your phone to remind you what the word of God says. Put some reminders in your phone to remind yourself what the word of God says. Why? Because it's the prayer of faith. 
that begins to move things. James 5.15, it says, in the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. Not the prayer of doubt, not the prayer of unbelief, I don't want some person, if I'm sick, laying in a hospital bed, come in and go, God, if it be your will, kind of prayer. No, I want somebody to come in and lay hands and say, Spirit of God, fill this room. Every sickness has to go. And if that's not the prayer that you want, this ain't the church for you, right? I I want somebody to lay hands on me in faith. I I did it between services, seeing people in the lobby, people in our church know, if I see you, you need prayer, we're going to pray right here. We're going to go. Why? It's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. It's the prayer of faith that brings back the prodigal. It's the prayer of faith that's going to restore your marriage. It's the prayer of faith that's going to change our nation. It's the prayer of faith. And how do I pray the prayer of faith? Because I know his word. And when I know his word, I know his will. Number six, repentance. I think this is wild. It it trips me up. Because Nehemiah could have easily, this dude is consecrated he is living for God he's a student of the scriptures y'all he's spending four months in prayer seeking the face of God and his repentance prayer sounds like this we have sinned we have not kept your commandments we have not kept your ordinance he didn't say they have not And I found in our culture, in our society, the further we go in God, the more that we're like, oh, these are the holy people and those are the sinners. And we point fingers at the Democrats, the Republicans, other nations, other people groups. They are the problems. And might I just tell you that that kind of prayer isn't gonna move anything. It's not gonna change anything because it's unity. And Nehemiah knew this, that he was a participator in the sin because he was tolerant of the sin. We stood by and watched when they took prayer out of our schools. We stood by and watched when they took the 10 commandments out of our uh, federal buildings. We stood by and watched as they removed God out of everything. So we are a participator in the sin just as much as they. And Nehemiah, more of his prayer is spent in repentance than it is anything else. Might it be said of us that more of our time is saying, God change me. God, we have sinned. God, I have messed up. Not just God change them, but God change us. God change our hearts. God move us. Not demonizing a people group or a select group of individuals, but instead saying, God, I am a sinner in need of grace. I need you today. I need you to move on my behalf. See Paul in Corinthians. I tell the college when you hear Corinthians, think girls gone wild, spring break. Like it's, they're doing some crazy stuff. If you've never read 1 Corinthians, it's messed up, y'all. They got, you think their people are sinning today. No, 1 Corinthians were the OG sinners, right? And, and Paul writes to them and he rebukes them. And he rebukes them harshly and it hurt their feelings. So Paul's writing to them in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. I love this. He says, yet now I'm glad. I'm glad that you were mad. Not because you were hurt and made sorry. He's like, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I was just telling you the truth. Here's the thing. You know the difference between being nice and kind? Nice doesn't tell you the truth because it wants to not hurt your feelings. Kindness is speaking the truth in love. We have a society that doesn't want truth. We want nice. But Paul says, I don't, I'm not, I'm not because I made, made you feel hurt or was sorry, but made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you felt a grief such as God meant for you to feel. God meant for you to feel that hurt when you sin. You're not supposed to feel good in your sin. You're supposed to feel hurt when you sin so that you might not suffer loss in anything on our account for godly sorrow that is in accord with the will of God produces repentance without regret leading to what? Salvation. But worldly sorrow produces death. Meaning this is there's a difference in being sorry that you got caught or sorry for the consequence and a repentance that says, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, if it's not according to your word, I don't want it in my life. If it's not part of the fruit of the spirit, I don't want it in my life. There's a difference between the two and Nehemiah lived a life. He, as you read through the book of Nehemiah, repentance marks most of his prayers. May it mark ours. May we be a people that go, God, change me. 
God, I want my heart to change because here's the thing is Nehemiah knew that he could not do what God's called him to do without God first having his heart. So how does he build a whole city, rebuild a whole city in 52 days? He starts it by doing this. He got down low. You know what's interesting to me is that when you read in the Bible, it says that Jesus, he's seated on the throne. And it says the four and 24 elders that they'll come in and bowing down, they cast their crowns before him. And another part of scripture, it says that with Jesus, a unity in the brethren is like the oil that runs from the beard of Aaron all the way down. The anointing always comes down. It doesn't go up. So if I want to live an anointed life, I got to go down low. And some of us, we're not living the anointed life that God's called us to live because we haven't got down low in a long time. We haven't been down low in our prayer time. And Nehemiah knew if I'm gonna see God build something up, I've gotta come down lower. If I wanna see, I'll just, can I talk to all the wives in the house? If you wanna see your husband and your marriage built up, you gotta get down low. If you wanna see your family and your kids begin to serve God, you gotta begin to get down low. If we wanna see God move in our nation, we gotta have a people that begin to get down low. I love that it says of the saints of old in Wheelersworth's house, that there was a spot in his bedroom where there was two spots worn out next to his bed. And it was the spot where he would kneel every night before bed. Might it be said of us that there are spots where the consistent prayer of us getting down low and God, we're going to get low so you can build things up high. God, we're going to get low so we can come under the anointing, so we can come under the place where you are. I'm calling to some people right now to come back to the secret place of prayer, to come back to the place of consistency in your prayer life. That it's not all about God, build me up, but God, I'm going to come down low. I'm going to come down low. I, I, I pray that this is wooing you into a place of prayer. I pray that you hear the call of the Father saying, come back to the secret place of prayer. Can I pray for you right where you're at? Father, I just thank you. Lord, I, I do a call to your people like you told me to say, arise and return. In Jeremiah 6, it says, where is the good path? It's the ancient past. And so, Father, right now, we go back to the ancient past of prayer, of consecration, of holiness, of righteous living. God, the, the old past, Lord, of, of fasting, of setting ourselves apart, that God, right now, of repentance. Lord, I thank you that this house is a house Lord of prayer, that this house is a house that's returning to you, Lord, where it's saying in our nation that things are declined. Father, we ask that you turn the statistic in Cattle Mills, that you turn the statistic in Sulphur Springs, that you turn the statistic in Greenville, because there's a people of God down on their knees crying out for you. If you're here in the sound of my voice, you say, Crystal, I don't know Jesus. I've never given him my heart, given him my life. Maybe you say, Crystal, that's me. I need to return to the Lord. I've been away. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to raise your hand right where you're at so I can pray for you. If that's you, you want to give Jesus your life for the first time or you want to rededicate your life to him. One, two, three. Lift your hands all across this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Come on in Sulphur Springs online. Can you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Take my sins. And by your grace, I take your righteousness. I make you the Lord of my life. I give you all that I am. I hold nothing back in Jesus' name. And every person who believed it said, amen. Come on, can we give it up for every person who just prayed that prayer? Hey, I'm so proud of you. If you prayed that prayer, can you do me a favor? Text the keyword DECIDED to 903-634-7135. A member of our team would love to follow up with you and get you anything you might need as you begin this incredible journey of faith. Amen. Come on, aren't you grateful for such a life-changing word this morning?
Come on. Well, I just want to take a few moments. If you said yes to Jesus this morning, that is the best decision of your life. So I want to challenge you to go on the next step. And so if you haven't done so yet, we want you to go through Grow Track. We want to help you discover your purpose for you to get plugged in and begin to be a part of what God is doing in his church. Go to IamOneChurch.com slash grow and sign up today. You will not regret taking that next step. Well, we're about to go in the time of our service where we have the honor and privilege of giving of our tithes, 10% of our income and offerings, anything above and beyond that. And in my life, I've always seen God just do the impossible. And my parents, two years ago, they purchased a home and my dad had gone through a lot of health issues, like their finances weren't good, work, all of that. And, and for some reason, and they got approved, they built this house and they have this house. And, and I, we always wonder like, well, how did that, did that happen? And so recently, Recently, we've been helping them budget and there was one thing he said he goes everything can be moved but there's one thing that cannot be changed and that is my recurring tithings and offerings and he's been doing that consistently he's like that is the non-negotiable that will not shift and then in that moment I realized that that is why that is why they were able to have the things they have and the provision that they have in their life so I want to challenge you this morning he is in control of it all and he is your provider so when you give you give in faith knowing that he will do it there's several ways that you can give here at one church you can go online to iamonechurch.com slash give you can also text to give we do have giving stations if you're a cash or a check giver as you exit our worship center and as you exit our building so as you prepare your gift i just want to remind you july 15th serve day is happening and if you've been a part you know an incredible time where we take everything god is doing in this building and we take it out outside of these four walls and we will impact our world so sign up for a project there's so many available for you for your families we believe God is going to do incredible things on July 15th so go to iamonechurch.com slash serve and sign up for a project will you stand with me as we pray for our giving if you're an online giver would you hold your phone in your hand hold your gift in your hand Jesus we trust you Jesus, we believe that you are who you say you are. So right now, we thank you, God, for supernatural favor, supernatural provision. God, I thank you over every household, not only financially, God, but I thank you for health. I thank you for strength, God. I thank you for a covering and a breakthrough over every family represented in this house, God. We thank you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.